So in this tutorial video, I want to talk about the basic approach to painting something much larger, but also simpler, like this terrain piece. This is the apartment building from Marvel Crisis Protocol. And this is sort of the demo version or the mock-up or proof of concept. I will be showing you the tutorial using the larger version. So this kit itself um, puts together very easily. There's um, it comes with three different stories. I've taken two kits and then one at two story, one at four, just for variety. I have glued it all together. I've seen many people choose to keep the floors uh, separate in some assemblies. This will allow you to have the flexibility to adjust the height of the building if you so choose. I've chosen not to largely because for this game, the actual height of the building doesn't matter. And I intend to have a variety of buildings in my eventual collection anyways. So I don't mind gluing all together. One of the advantages as well of having it fully assembled is that you can do all of the painting um, and texture work with the entire piece as a whole. When you sub-assembly it, because you end up working on each of these levels in sections or chunks, sometimes your texture work might not be consistent. Sometimes some of this weathering, like you can see these oil streaks and um, etc., don't or wouldn't really carry over. And so you're kind of limited in the continuity of texture and pattern work. However you choose to approach it, it's up to you. Um, a lot of the techniques will still apply. You just have to adjust to make sure that um, you're painting so that the entire thing looks cohesive. You can also see that on this piece, I have left the windows on the front as well as some of the door jams completely unassembled. And that's largely because It'll make doing the dry brushing and the brickwork on the core of the building much easier. And then when we get to doing the windows, um, things like the fire escapes, and when we're painting some of the greeblies like the sunroof, the um, top escape or top access, um, there's the water tanks, um, the gas meter, electric meter, uh, maybe some business size, keeping all those separate allows you to um, airbrush, base coat, dry brush, different colors very, very quickly. And that's one of the, the core, I don't want to call it a technique, but the approach that we're going to be using for doing this terrain piece is a combination of masking and a lot of easy techniques like dry brushing and oil weathering. The goal is to not necessarily paint super high quality display terrain pieces. Although you can definitely take these techniques and apply it. Um, you can definitely spend a lot of time painting individual bricks, highlighting and shading every individual window. But especially if the goal is to get good looking terrain on the tabletop without spending an inordinate amount of time, it's worth picking up and being able to lean on some of these quick and easy techniques to be able to get these done to a very good quality without having to overwork a piece or sort of spend uh, weeks or months on a single building. And then even in the final piece, once it's assembled, speaking of the Greeblies, um, certain components we're going to keep separate. Uh, the sunroof, for example, um, top escape, all separate. But once we've painted the windows, once we've painted the things like the gas meters and stuff, we can then glue them onto the building and do a final sort of weathering and um, unifying pass of oil filters, enamels, etc., to tie everything together. We've added some posters, some signage. On the roof of this one, I've added some uh, newspapers and debris and trash and stuff. And then this video tutorial is going to be one in its entire series of videos that I will be doing for different terrain pieces, scattered terrain, larger pieces, etc that I'm going to be doing for my Marvel Crest Protocol board. So as we go, I will be adding pieces to this. I may add some topiaries, some ferns, benches, chairs, etc. to add to these rooftops. And so this isn't meant to be a sort of, I'm going to finish this building and that's it. We're never going to touch it. But it's more as a starting point to get something done. And then as a living project, whenever I feel the urge to paint some terrain um, or add to the building, I'll even go and potentially add in more signage, more graffiti. I'll throw in some more posters to keep it relevant. And essentially sort of just keep the buildings updated and refreshed periodically. So the actual 
colors and materials you need. So talking about the paints, there's no specific colors that I recommend that you have to have. Um, it all comes down to the color or the, the visual appearance that you want to, to have and maintain, and then that will dictate the colors you use to achieve the end result you want. I highly recommend that you take a look at references, um, look up different types of apartment buildings, office buildings, get a sense of the overall color and finish of the brickwork that you want to mimic, and then grab colors accordingly. I'm going for a sort of a, a terracotta, ready orange, New York style um, apartment building. And so the colors that I've chosen and will be using are based around that. And I'll cover those specific recipes as I get to them. But for the sake of right now, for this part of the video, the specific colors don't actually matter. What I do want to cover briefly is certain materials and things I think you need um, and you'll require for certain techniques for this um, approach, a way of painting terrain. So the first is we're going to need some dry brushes. So I've got some cheap makeup brushes and then a larger artist opus brush. If you have any larger, great. We're going to be using this a lot, especially on the brickwork, the big one. And then for all the little greelies and smaller parts, we'll use the smaller ones. You'll also want to use an airbrush. Um, this will help you to apply some base coats very, very quickly. Otherwise, you're stuck hand painting them. And on larger pieces like terrain and vehicles that have a lot of large flat surfaces, it can be trickier getting a smooth finish quickly and without texture. So I highly recommend getting an airbrush, or if you don't have an airbrush, find some way to get some aerosol cans or spray cans in the color that you want or close enough to be able to apply those base coats very, very quickly. We're also going to be using a lot of painter's tape. So I have a um, medium and a large roll. And this will allow us to mask off pieces as we go so that we can quickly airbrush base coat, dry brush colors without worrying about overspraying or overpainting onto adjacent areas. Really, really important. And um, having a sharp hobby knife and a ruler to trim and cut the masking tape to the exact size and shape that you need will also be important. To do the brick and mortar work, you can skip this step, but I think that this really adds a sense of realism. And especially for that uh, New York style terracotta brick, I think the mortar work really helps to sell the overall aesthetic of the building. So for this, we're gonna be using just your um, standard construction uh, drywall compound. The brand itself doesn't matter. We're gonna be using this and then we're gonna be mixing it with water to turn it into sort of a, a paste that we can apply. And we'll be using a palette knife to do this. You can go large, you can go small. You want it large enough that you can apply a good amount without um, having to spend forever, but also small enough that you can accurately apply it into some of the more finicky areas. And then you can also use an old brush in particular to apply it to areas in the front of the building, even without the windows on, you do get some areas, um, particularly like here where there are uh, thin areas where it's hard to get the pal knife into. You may want to use an older brush that you can sort of brush on the paste. You'll also need an old J cloth or some sort of um, towel to, to wet and wipe off the drywall compound once you've applied it. I don't recommend using paper towel. When it gets wet, no matter how durable it is, it's gonna shred and we're gonna be wiping it a lot. You want something that will absorb, won't leave any residue or sort of paper material on the building. And then something that we can wash and reuse just to you know, save and um, not have so much paper waste and then finally, you're going to want to have some oils and enamels on hand. So I'll be using a couple of panel liners, frost streaks, dust and dirt deposits from Inky Interactive. And then I'll also be using a um, city dust weathering pigment. I don't have it on hand. I'll also be using this uh, light dust weathering powders from AK Interactive. Again, much like the paints, these specific colors don't matter. You can mix them up, change them up depending on the color 
and the look and feel and finish that you want to the environment that you want to convey. Um, if you're going for a more desert environment, you may want to use something like ochres, um, siennas. If you're going for more of a jungle, maybe you want to use some, some burnt umbers or darker browns. You know, the sky's the limit. Play around with it, have fun with it. If you don't want to use enamels, you can use oil paints. Again, there's no um, specific color you have to use. Although I would recommend if this is your first time doing it and you're looking at picking up certain colors are really, really good overall to have. I think a, a yellow ochre and a burnt sienna and a burnt umber or three oil colors or enamel colors are really, really good to have in your collection. They work great for a lot of environments. Um, having a, a black or an off black or uh, maybe a Payne's gray to do some panel lining and um, having whites or off whites to do filtering are all good colors to have. With oils and enamels, you want to make sure that you're not using water to clean your brush. You need to use mineral spirits, turpentine, um, something specific to clean oils and enamels. Water won't do it. If you're a brush sugar like me, don't lick your brushes. And then you'll also need to have separate brushes for these. Um, they are very harsh. There's a lot of chemicals involved and they will wear and tear on your brushes. You don't want to be using your fancy acrylic brushes for them. Synthetic brushes are best. And then you don't want to be using the brush that you use to paint acrylics with because the two paints will obviously interact differently with water and mineral spirits you want to keep them separate. So the first part of the building that we want to start with is the brick. This is the dominant part of the model and being able to visualize what that color looks like, what the overall value and tone will be, I think informs the decisions for how we paint every other part of this building. So everything from the window frames, um, door jams, steps, all the little detailings, even the trim on the roof, the color of the roof, all these things are impacted by the color that we paint the brick. And so that's why I want to start there. The Speaking very briefly, I guess, of the technique and the approach for making the main colors. So for this, I used AK's Black Red, which I airbrushed on just as a base coat over all of the brick. And then from there, I dry brushed AK's Medium Rust, Scale Color Mars Orange, Orange Brown, Beige Red, and then some Deep Brown as well, just in a variety of spots and basically just working my way up. Once I was happy with the tones for the overall larger panels, I masked off some of the, the trimming on the edges and dry brushed those up separately, just a bit brighter. On this piece, I went with a sort of a mid-tone, um, mid-dark tone red brick with a slightly brighter trim. And then because I don't want all of my buildings to have the exact same color and tone, as I'm doing the larger one, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go a little bit brighter. I'm gonna take this trim color that I used and paint the mid sections, the larger portion of the bricks in that color. And then I will um, go a little darker on the trim just to have a little bit of variety. Again, like I mentioned earlier, these specific colors of this don't really matter. Um, I highly recommend just looking at reference, identifying sort of the, the overall tones that are present in the brick color you want to mimic, and then picking colors and applying it randomly to see what sticks, what works, and how closely you can match the reference. I think it's important to be loose and experimental at this stage. You don't want the brick to look too uniform. Um, and depending on how much time you want to spend, you can even go in with individual washes, um, different glazes, and really pick up individual bricks that create the variety. I went a little faster and I just dry brushed some various um, blotches and patterns to avoid being uniform over all the brick, but without being too crazy in terms of the patchwork, mainly just so it wouldn't take too long. You can see that some of these areas are a little darker, some of them are a little brighter. And then because this brick is mid-dark tone, the white is really, really strong and just visually it knocks back a lot of that um, variety in the brick as well. So when you're experimenting, don't be afraid to really push the limit on how much you change up the tonal variety. You can see that as I was dry brushing and doing the brick and mortar work with the palette knife, there was a bit of damage on the brick where some of the paint scraped off, showing some of the primer. But I think it's really, really cool just to introduce some of that, I call it authentic battle damage. We will be applying varnish to this model throughout different stages as we work through. So um, if you're worried about this sort of damage, 
apply a little bit more and then um, make sure that the varnish has time to fully set, the paint has time to fully set before moving on to some of the more rough, vigorous steps, like applying the mortar so you don't scrape off this paint. So here we have all of the brick dry brushed. And you can see this is quite a bit brighter than the two-story building, just in terms of the overall tone and the value. The brick is still sort of that ready orange tone. However, because I used more of that rust orange base as opposed to the uh, black red, the brick ends up being quite a bit brighter. It does look a little bit messy right now, but that's because we have to get the mortar in there. Once it does, it'll neaten everything up and all the bricks will sort of tighten up just in terms of the overall finish. I also ended up painting these dividers brighter. It was just easier on my process and the dry brushing and the way that I chose to mask the brick. What I'm gonna do now is apply a coat of varnish. I'm gonna be using Games Workshop's Purity Seal for this. I'm gonna apply a couple of coats and then set this aside to dry for about an hour or two. Let the varnish set before I go in with applying the mortar work, mainly because I wanna make sure that everything is protected and I don't run into sort of that um, scraping paint issue that I had with the previous building when I was running the palette knife and the red paper towel over the model. I wanna make sure everything's dry and set because the, especially with the damp towel, when we start to wipe up the uh, drywall compound, it can, if we're too forceful, remove some of this paint on top. So we get the varnish and then we'll come back for the next important step. So once the varnish has set, now it's time to really dive into creating the, uh, the magic or the secret sauce of what makes these apartment buildings really pop. And that is doing the mortar work for the brick. So again, we're using just regular drywall paste, drywall compound. Um, you get this at any uh, home hardware or uh, construction store. And this is a rather old bin. So what I've done is I've actually um, mixed and diluted it with water. And you can see that it's almost like a, like a, like a paper mache sort of um, paste. Out of the pot, this um, is more of a, almost like a watery tofu texture, if you're Asian. Um, I'm struggling to find a better way to describe it. So you wanna just uh, mix in enough water so that it becomes very viscous, um, almost like oatmeal. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take this material and I'm wearing latex gloves. I found that this um, is particularly messy and then because I'm constantly having to rinse the cloth um, and wash my hands, it does tend to dry out my fingers and my skin. So if you are prone to sort of uh, dry skin, maybe just wear gloves for your protection. We're just gonna take our spatula and we're just gonna brush it over the surface of the brick. Now, this drywall compound has a very good working time. Even when dry, going in with some moisture, either on a brush or with a wet cloth, you can very easily correct and um, sort of tweak and erase. It's very, very forgiving. So there's no reason to um, have to feel like you're rushing this application. You can just sort of take your time. And I'm being as gentle as I can with the palette knife as I scrape across the, the brick. So be careful not to scratch or put too much pressure to take off any of the underlying paint. And just make sure that we're getting this mortar or this compound paste into every um, crevice of the brick. And one advantage to using gloves as well. If you really wanted to, you could use your finger and smush this around. I'm not going to. Um, mainly because it's gonna get messy enough, but like, just push that, that nonsense in. All right, and then we have our cloth. I'm gonna be using a um, microfiber towel, really, really old. Um, I wash my car a lot, so I have a lot of these uh, just lying around. And this is damp, and you're gonna to need to wash this quite a bit. And all we're gonna do is pull it across. And where we have some of this excess, we can try and just um, brush it over other parts of the model.
And then in areas like these little corners of these inset brickworks, what I'm going to do afterwards is go in with a brush and um, sort of just brush those away. But I'll wait until that's all fully dry before I get around to doing that. Again, um, you can keep working this compound uh, material for for days after it's fully set. Obviously, um, the longer you leave it set, the harder and harder it is to erase, kind of like oils. But I would say within the first 24 to 48 hours, you still have quite a bit of workability to the material. All you need to do is reintroduce some moisture. So either a damp towel, damp brush, um, just go back in and uh, erase and correct as you would. Now, one thing to bear in mind is um, it is in the warning label on something this small, probably not a significant issue. But if you are working on areas where you're going to have larger gaps or where a lot more of this um, drywall compound material is going to set, just be aware that um, it does shrink the more water you add. So when it evaporates um, or when it dries, some of that water evaporates and then the drywall compound will shrink and evaporate. And if the gap or the spacing is too large, you'll end up with cracking. Not as big an issue on these models where the gaps in the bricks is very, very small, but something to keep in mind if you're working on pieces with larger gaps, if you're working on something like a sidewalk. And then in these little corners, you can use an old brush and some, some water and go in and just erase and correct. You could even use an old brush and just dip it right in the drywall compound. In areas particularly like, um, where can I show you? Right here. Now obviously this is a little bit too big for me to get my spatula in, my pal knife. It's not really gonna fit, but I can just use my brush and just brush in that drywall compound. Yes, Jonesy. And then just like any other um, brick. And that's a very, very simple technique, very, very effective. On these larger areas, it is much easier because there's a lot of um, flat surfaces you can really move quickly. It's the front and the back of the building that does take a lot of time because of all these little nooks and crannies um, another reason why I recommend leaving all the windows off as well, it just makes it much, much easier to apply this step. So we'll go ahead and we'll do that. We'll probably take a couple hours just to do all the mortar. Um, again, this side and the opposite are fast. It's the front and the back that tend to take a little bit of time. And then we'll come back for uh, the detailing. And after about, I want to say about two hours, two and a half hours of work, the brick is done. You can see I've done it on all four sides. And sort of the patchiness and some of the roughness from the dry brushing, it basically gets kind of lost with the mortar work, which is sort of the intent. Um, and as I mentioned, you can basically be a little looser with sort of the tones of the brick. And so long as the brick is sort of a, a mid-tone or a dark tone value, it's going to contrast very well with the mortar. If your brick ends up being much brighter in value, mid bright tone, almost like sort of a, a khaki ivory cream color, something brighter, you're gonna find that the mortar work gets lost and you may not wanna do this for that kind of a building with that kind of a brick, or you find a darker mortar, maybe mixing um, the drywall compound with some pigments or some gray paints or brown paints to darken uh, the mortar work you end up applying. The windows do look a little messy. You can see that there is some of the drywall compound stuck in some of the cracks and crevices, but these are mainly on the edges. And once you've glued the window down, it hides all of that detail. As long as it's not caked on too heavily, there's no reason to spend too much time cleaning up all that mess because the windows still insert very nicely and it hides all that mess. I do want to talk 
um, very briefly as well on two different materials or two different uh, techniques I experimented with to try and mimic this mortar work. So this was a test piece from a field print I did. I was testing with some brick color and then I wanted to try um, three different materials or, or sort of ways of doing the mortar. So the first I tried was using the Vallejo ground texture and it's a smooth paste. You apply it very much like you would with the drywall compound. However, you can't really work it once it's fully set and cured. So you actually have to go small patch by small patch and clean it up. And I found with this one, it didn't wipe off or clean up as easily as the drywall compound. Doing this took far longer than I would have liked. And on or translating this technique to a building this large with this many bricks and that this fine of a detail, I didn't think this was a very efficient or um, really effective way of achieving the look. Next, I tried some uh, white ink. So I used um, just typical white India ink. Behaves kind of like a uh, pseudo wash oil um, application. Capillary action pulls it in, um, but it does take quite a few coats to dry. It doesn't consistently dry um, with an even coverage. And I found that you couldn't really clean up the brickwork. The white would stain it, and it wasn't very easy to correct without pulling all of the white ink from the crevices. So that was a no-go or a non-starter. I used uh, white oil paints diluted into a wash, and this was probably the most promising of the techniques I tried up until this point. My issue with it was it took many, many passes to really coat evenly, and it was a balance between diluting it enough to try and take advantage of capillary action to fill the gaps, while at the same time um, being translucent enough to coat very, very well without doing too many passes. You could do um, a, a, a more opaque application, fewer passes, and then using mineral spirits to wipe down and clean up the edge. However, that would have been a lot more work in sort of the post-application phase. And again, the bricks on this pillar are much, much larger, larger gaps, um, deeper recesses. On this terrain piece, the bricks are much smaller, gaps are smaller, and then the recesses are quite shallow. And I was worried that the ink, or the, the, the white oil paint might not translate well in technique onto the Marvel Crisis Protocol buildings. So I ended up settling on the drywall compound, experimented with this, um, in this basing, it worked very, very well, and that was the technique I ultimately settled up on. And so um, just a bit of a, I guess an insight into some of the techniques I tried, maybe you're thinking about trying them. I'm giving you my opinions. If you want to experiment and try them as well for your own work, by all means, the drywall compound is just what I found worked for me and it works well. So um, I'm going to leave this piece of terrain to basically set overnight. I want the compound to set a little bit more. And then what I'm going to do afterwards is go back in with um, some moisture and just do some final cleanup tomorrow. So the problem right now is because the compound is still fresh, if you go back in with a brush, um, any moisture is going to reactivate it and it's going to pull it out of the crevices. You want to give it some time to fully set so that when you go back in and clean up some of these um, finer edges or finer details, it's not going to take away all of that mortar immediately. So once we've done the brickwork and that's the majority of the model, it's time to move on to the uh, finer details, things like working on the rooftop here, as well as the base trim on the back. We've got a few doors, um, just regular walk-in doors, loading doors in the back here, some window trimming, some door frames, things like that. And the order that you do them really doesn't matter. Um, but when you're tackling each particular element, especially if, as we're gonna be approaching this, doing sort of, um, using our masking approach and tackling each part in turn. Sequencing is important. So for example, on this rooftop, I'm going to be using the airbrush and uh, a couple of dry brushing, stippling techniques. We're going to tackle the big flat area first. We're then going to mask off this flat as well as the brick around it. And then we'll airbrush and dry brush the frame. This way we can very easily and quickly work up a certain part of it, cover that up, and then move on to the next one. I have no worry about um, being too careful hand painting all of these details. 
you'll see this more in my approach as well when I start handling uh, the doors and the windows. And a little bit of planning, thinking through the way you want to sequence your approach to painting these details can allow you to really cut a lot of corners and um, not have to spend too much time being super accurate with your paint application, especially because we are leaning a lot on very messy, very quick, very rough techniques that don't cater well to accurate painting. So on the rooftop, we're going to be doing a very simple gray mix. Uh, I'm going to start with a base coat of AK Graphite through the airbrush, and that's actually going to be um, sort of my mid bright tone. I'm then going to take some ash gray and I'm going to airbrush a bit of shading into the crevices here before I go back in with some brighter grays, maybe some off whites, and then maybe um, some, some dirtier contrast colors, non oil washes, etc., to add a bit of weathering and stippling on the rooftop. A really, really easy technique to do this with is to use your airbrush and instead of spraying paint through the airbrush, having paint loaded onto something like an old um, brush or a toothbrush and then spraying the air through the bristles. By having paint loaded onto the brush or toothbrush in this way and then using the airbrush to sort of splatter air and paint or splatter the air through the paint that you have loaded on, you can create this very cool dot pattern with a lot of effort and it helps to create that sort of random haphazard pattern and feel without a whole lot of effort rather than having to go back in and hand paint all of those details. You will go back in with some weathering powders and some oils, um, but I'm not going to worry about that at this stage. I want to get everything on the building painted first before worrying about those fine-tuned details. Insofar as the colors used for the stippling, again, if in doubt, use some reference, but think about the environment that your building's gonna be in. I'm gonna be using non-oil to get some, some grease stains. Um, maybe I'll introduce some browns or some dirt, and then um, we'll add the weathering powders to get some city dust, um, sort of dirt and grime to it. So with all the splattering applied, I think it's a little too heavy, a little too dark. I like the texture, but the colors are a little too stark, and so I want to knock it back a bit. So I'm going to take that um, mid-bright tone that I applied, so we're going to be using the AK Medium Sea Gray. In the airbrush, I've got this diluted uh, probably about five or six parts water to one part paint. And I'm just going to very gently airbrush glaze this over some of the darker spots to knock back the, the strength and the value. So I really like the sort of pastel green recipe that I used for my test rooftop. So I'm going to be using the exact same color for this, and it's a very, very straightforward, very simple recipe. It's a base coat of AK Gunship Green, and then a heavy dry brush of Green Sky, followed up with a couple of oil pin or enamel pin washes and streaking grime. Very simple, um, quick and dirty, but I think it looks very, very good, very effective because of just how detailed these pieces are and how easily they take to the dry brushing. I'm going to paint the door in this color, the front door, or at least the front door for the apartment. The business door will be a different color that I've masked it over. And you can see that I've used um, masking tape. We go through a lot of this on this building, doing the sides, as well as the top I've masked all the way around. So we've covered up the, the base. And this will allow me to airbrush and dry brush the trim very, very quickly, very easily, without sort of um, fussing about how accurate I'm being or very carefully hand painting anything. I'm going to paint this um, top beam the same color. However, because of sequencing, um, I need to paint the door, or I guess the, the blinds here, and then the door jams first before masking it. It's just easier that way. So this piece will be the exact same color recipe up here. I won't show it on camera, but I'll have to paint the rest of these doors first before getting to that. So I'm going to start with a, an airbrush base coat with the gunship green. You can do this by hand. But, and especially on these larger flat parts of the roof, it's just quicker to use the airbrush and apply the base coat. You can do it by hand if you use a very big brush, not a big deal. Make sure you dilute so you're not covering up those details. And you'll need to do two or three passes to get a nice solid coat. From there, we're just going straight into green sky using the big artist focus dry brush. And we're gonna use a combination of dry brushing and stippling 
to, to create the patchwork texture and highlighting on these green elements. We can approach painting some of the other doors in much the same manner. So I don't have any doors on the side, but I do have a door on the front and a door on the back. And I wanted to link these doors as belonging to the same business by having them in a different color that pops out and I chose a more saturated red. It'll contrast well, I think, with the green. And because it's just on this particular part of the model, having that sort of saturation will make a nice sort of pop detail. Um, pretty much the same technique as the green. I just used two colors. I used AK Burnt Red and Blood Red to do the base coat and stippling dry brushing. Working my way to the two colors using the masking tape to protect the areas like the door frames and door jams all the way around. And see, once I've peeled the paint off, we have a nice clean edge. So when we're painting the loading doors in the back, again, using the masking tape, we're masking off. Um, we don't have to go right to the edge of the door jams or the door frames because we're going to be painting those afterwards. All we need to do is protect the brick and anything around like this red door from any errant brush strokes while I'm dry brushing. The colors I'll be using I'm going to be base coating with AK's Ash Gray and then dry brushing through graphite, medium sea gray, and pale gray. Because there is a bit of a texture to the door, we're not going to ram jam the brush too much in there. We'll do some light dry brushing to capture the surface texture. And then we're going to use some stippling and some sponge weathering to capture some chips and dings, more so around the bottom and the edges of the door. It's where I imagine a lot of that wear and tear is going to collect and go going up and down constantly. We're going to have stuff um, hitting the, the bottom trim of this. And so we want to capture a little bit of extra detailing and highlighting there as well. Before we finish up painting the window frames and door frames and jams, we're going to be painting the windows. You can see that I've already masked off the window for the red door here, as well as the storefront. And we're going to tackle the windows for the skylight, as well as all of the apartment or unit windows in exactly the same way. It's a simple two color recipe. It's AK dark sea blue and gray blue. And we're going to use our um, sponge or dry brush stippling technique. We're not dry brushing, but we're stippling. And then we're combining that with a bit of wet blending. So on top of our base coat, we're going to then start mixing in progressive amounts of gray blue. And we're going to gently stipple and wet blend our way up to an almost pure gray blue highlight. And then rather than going from top down, bright to dark, we're going to go bottom up, uh, bright to dark. Get a bit of that sort of light reflection happening, create a bit of an interesting look to it. And on my first apartment building, I made the mistake of not going bright enough with the gray blue. So you want to make sure that the blue, um, the mid-tone of the gray blue highlight you have is fairly bright, um, depending on how bright or dark you're going to take the frames, as well as the areas around it. You want it to have at least a strong visible um, mid-tone to dark tone blue blend. So I'll just be showing this um, color recipe or color mix on the window frames, but it's the exact same. I'll be doing it on the door frames and the window here, as well as the loading bay door frame and the back door frame here. It's just hard to keep this building in focus and actually paint. We're gonna be using the same color recipe as the loading door, but we're gonna go a little brighter. We're gonna start with graphite and then go into medium sea gray and then pale gray. And we're gonna go pretty heavily with the pale gray using our um, stippling, dry brushing sort of wet blending technique that we also did on the windows. So you can see that I have masked off all of the windows as well. There is an inner window frame. I'm not quite sure what color I want to do that yet. I, I may go slightly brighter with the pale gray um, and do sort of a, a white window frame, or I may go a little darker. I'm not quite certain yet. I know I don't want it to be the same color as all of these window frames as well, hence why I've half masked it as it currently stands, and then I'll tackle it after I've painted that. So once again, we're gonna start with a base coat of graphite. You can use an airbrush for this. Um, I'm just gonna use my Artist Opus D large dry brush, and I'm just gonna work quickly through a base coat of this as the main color. And then working in small batches, I'm gonna do some quick dry brushing with the medium C gray. Before going in with the pale gray to do a, a stippling pattern, 
to get that sort of worn beaten texture and brighten up those highlights. We're gonna be using enamels and weathering powders to define some of the crevices and shadows. So if you do over dry brush, it's not a big deal, not the end of the world. I'm also gonna paint the door frame that covers the uh, apartment door in the same way, keep it nice and bright. And I think we'll also tackle the um, frame of the storefront side with this color recipe as well. So before I paint the inner window frames, and I think I'm gonna do them in sort of a, a mid a mid-tone gray just to have a bit of separation between the dark windows and the brighter frames. I want to add a little bit of detailing to the windows just to not a boring um, blue fade. Now, in my smaller apartment building, I did some blinds and I did some curtains, and we're gonna keep them simple, mainly just to paint the, the silhouette or the, the shape or pattern of it, and we're gonna be using AK's pale gray for this. You can be a little more um, or a little less crisp with the edges, mainly because there's gonna be some diffusion and um, some refraction, I guess, of the overall sharpness of whatever's in the room through the glass and whatever glare from sunlight. So you don't need to be um, super precise with this. You can be a little bit more um, loose, a little bit more almost watercolory. And we're gonna do, um, I think, three different types of blinds and sort of window dressings. We're gonna do your, your typical um, up and down, uh, I guess, what if I show you? So we're going to do something like this, where it's the, the, the blinds that can open and close. These, the blinds that go up and down. And then I didn't do it on this building, but we're going to do blinds that go left and right. So we're going to have the halves on either end. So for the curtains or the blinds that go up and down, very simple. We're just going to pick the bottom point and we're going to paint a line across and we're going to fill all that gap. And keep your paint nice and looted. You want to go for a nice um, even finish. And then because these um, sort of blinds typically have a, a rod running to the bottom just for stability and to make it easier to pull down, there's usually a, a seam or a fold where the rod is inserted before you have the actual entire blind. So we're going to take a slightly darker gray. I'll be using graphite for this. Let me check on this base coat. And we're going to go in and just paint a very thin line to mark out the top of um, where the rod would be. And we'll just apply a few more coats of the pale gray, neaten up this base coat. Tighten up that edge. The curtains that go up and down are done the exact same way, only go vertically instead of horizontally. So, for example, right here, I'm just picking arbitrary points and that line straight down. And then we'll fill in just like we did on the top.
Now, if you want to add um, a subtle hint of folds, you can add a little bit of the graphite into the color gray, create a bit of a shadow, and you can sort of hint at deeper folds in the curtain. But again, be um, be subtle and you can be a little abstract with it. I don't think the folds will be super well defined, especially if you through the window. Um, take a look at reference for New York apartment windows and see sort of how those blinds uh, look and paint to match that. And we'll paint something on the other side. Uh, you can mirror the, the same width or you can adjust it slightly so that it's a little more natural feeling, that the blinds aren't pulled equidistant. And you don't, for, for these ones, you don't specifically have to use pale gray. You can actually use different colors if you wanted to, um, especially for these vertical curtains, because curtains are never the same color, or not always. And then to paint the vertical blinds that open and close, there's two different ways you can paint them. You can paint them either fully closed or fully open, and then you can vary up the height in terms of how high or low they are pulled down. So to paint them when they're closed, um, you're going thick white lines and then thin dark lines in between. So what I like to do to paint um, these is typically to paint thin lines to bounder or border the uh, the individual line, and then fill in the gap. The hardest part about doing this one is keeping these uh, boundary lines equidistant. Now you just take your time and just be as accurate as you can. If you need to correct, go back in with some of your dark sea blue and adjust. But if not perfect, it's not a big deal. I actually think um, so. That imperfection helps to add to that painterly style or painterly feel. Now, usually these blinds will also have a thin um, metal rod or bar at the bottom that'll help to pull it all up and down. So when you're happy with the height of it, add a, a thinner line at the very, very bottom to anchor uh, the blinds. And then to finish, we're going to paint the, uh, the strings that hold it all together, one on either side.
And then on one end, you either pick the right or the left. And um, I would recommend keeping it consistent because typically for an apartment building, um, the units are going to be um, mass manufactured, but they're all going to have sort of the same core elements of core parts. And typically the blinds are um, all the same when they're installed. Hence why I would also probably use uh, similar colors for these blinds. So you want them to match on the same side. And we're going to have the drawstring. And typically when the blinds are higher up, the drawstring is longer and vice versa. So I'll make sure that you're painting accordingly. Add a little handle pulley thing, whatever, on the end. And that's it. To paint the blinds open, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to do uh, thin white lines or thin gray lines and leave the gaps in between much larger. And then you can also do everything in between to have blinds at a um, half open state. And then when you uh, carry the pattern, if you carry the blinds down through both windows, make sure that you're accounting for the, the distance where the bar is. Oh, we're messy there. But that's fine. And once again, once you're at the bottom, Paint in that second thicker bar. And then we'll paint the vertical strings that connect them all. And for this one, the uh, pull string or draw string. And then because the blinds are lower down, we'll shorten this one compared to this one. And maybe I will let me bring it to about there. And then to mix things up, you can leave some of the windows uh, blue as well. And that way you have a little bit of extra variety. Um, within the window so it's not so uniform. Um, and we're going to do this for all the windows before going back to doing the window uh, frames. And then once we have all of our blinds and inner detailing done, it's time to finish up with this last window frame. So we're going to be using three colors for this. AK Graphite is going to be our main base coat. We're going to highlight up with medium sea gray. And then we're going to use some ash gray on the bottom lip or the underside of this top window frame. So we'll start with that. We'll start with the ash gray. We'll apply a, just a quick line there. And then we'll take our graphite. And you want to be as neat as you can. Make sure you're not overpainting onto any of the blue.
And then we'll take some medium sea gray. We'll mix a little bit into our graphite for the first highlight. And we'll just sort of stipple texture it down. And while that's what you can take some graphite to blend up at the bottom. And then some pure medium sea gray to finish up the highlight on the top. We'll take our 50-50 mix and highlight the bottom edge right here just a little bit. I'm going to repeat that for all of the window frames. So one step that we want to do before we finish um, with the windows and attach them or glue them onto the apartment building is to do a little bit of panel lining. You can do this step once you've glued the windows to the building. I think it's just easier to manipulate and to actually work on them while they're all in their separate components like this. So we're going to be using AK's panel liner. This is an enamel paint, so you're going to want to use um, a brush that you use for oil paints. Treat them like oil paints, you can dilute them and thin them with mineral spirits. Clean up your brushes and you can erase with mineral spirits as well, just like with oil paints. The color I'm using is for, I want to say, white and green camel. I don't know, but it's something for green camouflage and sort of this murky green brown color. But as a pan liner, it's also very thin in terms of its um, translucency. So it goes very, very well. Let's see what it looks like here. Just going to go ahead and focus this color on some of the crevices. And we're going to let Capillary actually do all of the work for us. And then because we can treat it like an oil, we can go back in with um, mineral spirits and we can erase and push this color around. Just gonna go ahead and um, hit up all of these joins and these crevices in the windows. And also do the same for the uh, roof trimming on the top, mainly the front facade where all the details are. We lost a bit of it to our draw brushing, so we can just use uh, some of the panel lining to pick up these details again. If it gets a little messy, not a big deal again when this color dries. It is a fairly soft color. It's not going to overpower the green and having a little bit of sort of uh, the weathering on there will add a nice sort of uh, dirty look to the green. And before we dive into the final steps of um, adding sort of like posters and the signage and um, sort of like newspaper scattering debris, along with any sort of um, weathering with oils and enamels, we want to tackle some of the accessories and the glue that go along with the building. Um, mainly just because I like to segment or I like to compartmentalize the way I approach these models. And so I want to get all the painting done first with the acrylics, and then I'll do a first pass of weathering with my enamels. I'll add some uh, details like posters, the billboards, the signs, and then do a final pass of um, weathering with the enamels as well as some weathering powders before I finalize the pieces. So here you see um, the accessories that come with the apartment building. This is doubled up because um, some of these were done already. And I sort of just want to show you what the end result looks like and part of the approach I took. And then of course the fire escape, I'm using all four for the tall building. And then the water cooler tower just because I hadn't had a chance to build it yet before painting my first apartment building. For the um, skylight, we painted the windows just like we did on the building. So dry brushing and stippling, but blending from that dark sea blue into, I believe it was the spectrum blue, gray blue. And then using some masking tape, I masked off all of the windows before painting the trim with that uh, green recipe, gunship green and green sky. We also used that same green color for the door on the rooftop axis which I painted and then masked off to then do the gray 
of the actual uh, compartment. And for the colors for that, that's the uh, AK ash gray, graphite, meaning sea gray, and then pale gray. That same gray recipe is also used for the gas meter and voltage meter. And then I used the green gray recipe for the water cooler. I kept these in separate components. So the top half and the post is one. I was able to airbrush the green, do all the uh, stippling and blending there, airbrush the gray on the actual support frame, stippled that, and then putting it all together. Fire escape, same recipe as the gray, the ash gray all the way through the pale gray, just quick dry brushing. And there you have it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off the uh, masking tape and then we'll jump to the first pass of enamels for weathering. So much like with the windows, I'm gonna start with some panel lining. So for this, I'm gonna be using that same blue, blue and green camouflage panel liner from EK. Um, there's no set color, really. It's more just um, experimentation, sort of the look that you want, and then playing around with different colors to simulate different environments and different fields. I'm just going to uh, pick out all these crevices, focusing on using capillary action to do all of the work for me. And again, this is very much like an oil paint, so you always go back in with some mineral spirits and like a Q-tip or a clean brush and clean it up afterwards. So being messy or loose with this at this stage, it's actually um, one of the joys and what I really enjoy about painting terrain is how liberating and freeform it is so not have to be so precise. And do the same thing for a structure like the rooftop axis. We'll just black line these crevices. And then on over paint like this, some of those periods when you push it around. We could even do a, a little soft glaze in the bottom and stain the surface a little bit to um, add a little bit of extra color. So once we've done our panel lining, you can see we're just how subtle it actually is. And I didn't really do much cleanup on this from what I actually showed you in the previous step. So um, you can be fairly loose with this. It doesn't dry or finish as heavy as it does appear when it is wet. So that's one of the good things about these enamels is they are fairly soft compared to using oils and why I like using them for very subtle effects and weathering. Our next step is to add some rust and streaking and we're gonna be using AK's Rust Streaks enamel color. And this is a very um, soft, almost burnt sienna color with uh, a bit of an orange tone in there. So we're gonna pick areas where we would expect to see rust um, around things like these bolts, maybe this little handle right here. And much like if we were working with oils, again, we can apply this. And there is a workability to it for a short while. Um, once it dries, once it sets, unlike oils, you're not going to be able to work it. But while it's still wet, you can go back in with mineral spirits and you can um, erase it, you can shift it, you can soften it up. So while it's not as forgiving as oils, it still has sort of that playing time and can be quite, um, quite an expressive medium to use. Much more so than just using acrylic paints to achieve this effect. Okay, and then for areas like on this door, for example, maybe uh, we'll get some rust streaking on the side of the sign. Down this handle here. We will capture some on these larger flat panels, give it a little bit more interest. And we can apply the same thing onto the building as well, onto the walls. We can do these soft rust streaks. Um, I try and find areas where there's um, some of this chip damage 
from our uh, sponge and stipple weathering. And I'll try and catch some rust streaks on theirs, on theirs, on the um, edges of these scratches. I'm going to try not to go too overboard with this. Just one or two um, strong key areas on each side, just to give it a little bit more visual interest. And we're building, um, we can do the exact same thing as well. So we're going to pick out some of these um, columns. I'm just going to streak it down a little bit and give the the surface of this building a little bit more um, sort of texture. We can catch some of the edges of these window frames as well. Now, when you're doing it on the brick building, the, the drywall compound is going to absorb some of this color and you're not going to have that workability. So you're going to want to be a little bit more accurate with the application of this and sort of decide where you want the color to go before you start applying it. Because once you've applied it um, on the drywall elements, it's much, much harder to erase. On the side of the building, on these corners, we can do the same thing as well. Just And you can go heavy with it, give it a darker, a darker line, or dilute it for a softer, uh, softer color shift. Next step of our first pass is to do some dust and dirt, and we're going to use the dust and dirt deposits also from AK. This is a nice sort of a dusty. Um, dusty yellow, dusty khaki color with a touch of brown in there. And we're just going to catch this or concentrate this in these crevices, predominantly in the top, where we're going to have the sort of the, the weather, um, sort of sand and debris and stuff that's been flowing around and just collecting. We're not going to go overboard with this color because it does dry pretty, pretty strongly. We want just enough to add a little bit of variety to some of these top edges and corners. So tops of the door jams here, door handle. Maybe catch a little bit on this top right here. Now I have noticed that uh, this enamel doesn't take the capillary action as well. So you're going to want to work in small sections pull the paint across, or the normal across, to apply it, and then go back in with mineral spirits to clean up any sort of overpaint or, or uh, mis, misapplication. Try and avoid any direct downward pulling. This isn't a, um, a weathering streak that we're applying. This is literally the deposit of dust. So we're not going to see the dust um, pull down edges like that. Maybe we might have some dust like built up in the bottom corner there, okay? On something like this uh, gas meter, voltage meter, maybe we'll have some, um, yeah. And then on the skylight, for example, we're going to have dust collecting in these bottom crevices. Nice and subtle. And when it dries, you can see it looks something like this. 
So now that we're done our first pass of enamels, it's time to move on to doing the decals, posters, signage, all the little things that sort of give the, uh, the terrain piece life and make it feel not just like a piece of functional um, architecture, but to have this sort of detail lends a scale to it that we couldn't possibly achieve by hand painting. So for example, things like these little um, gas line, voltage line, warning labels, um, the inspection labels, things that we're putting on, on um, for example, the gas meter. I couldn't possibly paint this. Up. Some people might be able to, but being able to print these out and put them on there makes it feel like we're looking at something that's been scaled down or miniaturized and conveys sort of the, the realism of um, the world that we're creating on the tabletop. Now, I'll have links to the PDFs I'm using for this building, as well as stuff I use for my newspapers and my propaganda posters, so you can pick and choose how you want to apply them. Um, as I always say, there's no right or wrong way to do this. It just comes down to how much detail you want to put in, how busy or how um, minimalistic you want the building. And then think about what makes sense. Um, for example, on this gas meter, right, we're going to have the uh, the warning label and we're going to have the the inspection label underneath and that's all we need on the back of this building where we have the loading dock i imagine maybe it's uh not a lot of available parking so we're going to have a no parking delivery sign as an example right things like that that um not just lend that realism but a realism that makes sense to apply these is very simple once you've cut them out we're going to use some tweezers old brush, and then you can use PVA glue. I'm using Mod Podge for this. You don't really have to do any sort of heavy dilution. Get a bit of that Mod Podge, brush it on. This brush is a little dirty. And we'll do the same thing for you. And once you have the labels applied, go back over it with a thin layer of your PVA or Mod Podge. Make sure that you get all of it, because we're going to go back in once we do our um, final pass of enamels and weathering, and we're going to dirty these up. So you want to make sure that there's no exposed paper, nothing that can trap or, or absorb the moisture and sort of ruin any sort of weathering you put on top. So we'll go ahead and we'll just do a pass over the, the entire building, apply all of our decals and posters and warning labels um, on things like these fire escapes. I'll probably glue them onto the building before we do our final weathering pass. And once we've applied all of our little decals, we can go back in with a final pass of enamels and we'll do some extra streaking and weathering on not just the decals that we applied, but on parts of the building where, um, for example, once we've added this uh, gas meter, we want to add a few rust streaks to where it actually attaches to the building. So much like in the previous step, we're just going to take our uh, streak and grime or our rust streaks, whatever color you still choose, and we'll just lightly brush it on. With the stickers, again, you want to make sure that you've applied enough of your Mod Podge or PVA to coat the paper. Any exposed paper is immediately going to saturate or soak up all those enamels and sort of blot and not look very natural. So you want to make sure that you take the time to prep uh, the materials. So on the gas meter here, maybe uh, where we have these things bolted in. Get a little bit of streaking happening there. Dirty up these signs a little bit. And same on these larger posters. Uh, you can keep them as pristine or as sort of weathered as you want. 
and with the Mod Podge uh, layer on them. They're not glossy, but they have a, a sort of glossy finish, almost like the gloss varnish, and you can see that um, we're able to just lightly brush it off and um, move the enamels around to add a little bit of, of weathering to it. I'm going to also apply some weathering powders onto the corners of the uh, roof trim, and I'll be using the Light Dust City Pigments from IKEA for this. And we're just going to very liberally push this into the corners and then uh, fade it out with the brush. Uh, make sure you're using an old brush for this. And once we've applied the powders to fix it all to the base and protect it, because this is a gaming piece, we're going to use mineral spirits loaded into a spritzer bottle. I'm going to saturate the top, basically wherever I've applied the weathering powder. And this will help to fix the pigment before we apply our uh, final varnish. You're going to want to make sure that you saturate the entire base, uh, or the rooftop rather. Otherwise, you're going to get um, sort of these tide marks almost like a, a glaze that's been thin too much. So if I left it like this, once the um, mineral spirits evaporates, some of this powder is going to pull and settle along these edges. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you saturate the entire base or surface, even if there was no powder applied that way. So if any um, sprayed pigments or powders get pulled around, it's going to dry much more evenly and without any sort of edging to it. So this is to dry for about 45 minutes to an hour, and our building is pretty much done. You can also go in if you want with some uh, white or off-white paint. You can paint little bird poop markings, um, things like that, and just have a lot of fun with it. So that's it for this tutorial video. The content is pretty front-loaded, largely because the technique for painting all of the tinier elements and greeblies is really just a repetition of the simple approach that I've carried through the entire piece. That is our quick and dirty dry brush and wet stipple blending technique. But I think I've covered all of the important elements, in particular the brickwork and the mortar work, as well as our use of enamels and weathering in combination with bold colors and posters to sell the detail. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and subscribe for more awesome weekly content. You can also follow my Instagram for daily hobby updates and subscribe to my Patreon for exclusive video tutorials every month. Links will be in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and as always, happy hobbying.